Hello, Anime Advisor here. The spring season is well underway, and before we get too removed, it's time to go over some anime from the previous season. As usual, we've got quite a few anime to get through, so let's go ahead and start the Winter 2017 Anime Review. As is customary, I like to start the season reviews off with bad anime from the season. And for the first time, the anime I'm covering was an anime I originally covered in a preview. That anime being... Trickster. I covered Trickster back in the Fall 2016 anime preview, so if you want to detail the synopsis, you can check that video out. I'd do it here, but that wouldn't mean I'd have to care about this anime to some extent. There's a variety of things that had me interested in this anime at the start. It being an original anime, it being tagged as a mystery, and the slightly futuristic setting. However, most of those completely fell through when put into practice. As slightly futuristic settings go, it's alright. It's got some techie stuff and some robotic stuff on display, though nothing all that unique. The anime ends up being less of a mystery and more of a mundane action thriller. Now, the next part is on me for not doing enough research on Trickster for the Fall 2016 preview. Despite my anime list listing it as an original anime, which isn't completely untrue I suppose, it's actually loosely based on Edogawa Rampo's The Boy Detectives Club, specifically with the characters and some of the plot. However, since there is source material, loosely based or not, you'd assume those characters would be interesting. That is not the case in this situation. Kobayashi for the most part has one emotion, anger, because he can't die. Hanasaki is slightly better if only because he can show more than one emotion. Akechi is probably the most interesting character, though a lot of that doesn't happen until the second half of the season. As I alluded to earlier, it comes across as a mundane action thriller, only exasperated by the generic character designs, the bland animation, and basic cinematography. In fact, there were times where Trickster got so boring, I found myself using it as background noise while I was reading a book or writing a script for one of my videos. It's kind of amazing how much one can get done during a 23 minute episode of Trickster. Trickster is honestly less bad than just bland. It's dull. It's boring. It's mundane. It's humdrum. It's commonplace. It's uninteresting. It's stale. It didn't do anything particularly offensive except waste my time. Lumped together with all the other mediocre anime, it will eventually fade from memory and be forgotten. Thus will be the fate of Trickster. Though I guess it does remind people of Rompo's work, so there's that at least. As per usual in my season review videos, it's time to go over a couple of short running anime that aired during the season. Short run time anime don't get nearly the same amount of attention or coverage as their longer length counterparts. Which is why I like to take the time to focus on a couple of them every season. Also as usual, because they're shorts, I'll keep my review of them short as well. The first short I'm covering, Ninja Girl and Samurai Master. Rescued from nearly drowning, the young Chidori wants to pay back her savior's kindness. Her cute and innocent appearance may not show it, but she's actually a highly skilled ninja. Years later, Chidori and her friend come to serve under the man who saved her, the ambitious warlord, Oda Nobunaga. Ninja Girl and Samurai Master simply enough is a historical comedy. It parodies and pokes fun at many historical figures and battles during the late Sengoku period, a period in Japanese history marked with social upheaval, political intrigue, and near constant military conflict. The jokes in Ninja Girl and Samurai Master sometimes come a little too fast. On top of that, if you're not familiar with the historical character or event that's being parodied, it's probably not going to be that funny to you. It is a very cute aesthetic, which I find is one of its charms, especially because of how violent and bloody it can get. The characters all seem to play off each other well, as you eventually come to the realization that Nobunaga is surrounded by a bunch of idiots. Interestingly enough, the first season consists of 26 episodes, making it a leftover from the Fall 2016 season. Also, you probably noticed I said first season, which means the second season has already been announced. Overall, Ninja Girl and Samurai Master is short, cute, historic fun, and definitely worth checking out if you're any type of history buff with a sense of humor. And the other short I'm covering today, Nyanko Days. It follows Yuko Konagai, a shy first year high school student, and the only friends she has are her three cats, She, Ro, and Ma. However, one day she meets Azumi Shiratori, who also loves cats. And the stage is set for a fluffy and cute comedy about the daily life of Yuko and her cats, Yuko and Azumi's friendship, and the interaction between cats. You've probably already noticed that the so-called cats in Yonko days aren't regular cats, but cute cat girls. From a narrative and visual perspective, it makes for a cute and fun anime. However, from an ethical perspective, I'm a bit confused on the world Yonko days is set in. The cats aren't just humanoid cats, but also draw, read, and talk. Yep, talk and not just to each other, but also to humans as well. The cats are seemingly self-aware, which begs the question what type of society are these cats living in? Unfortunately in that regard, this anime is not a political drama on the ethics of keeping cat girls as pets, 
but a simple and cute slice of life comedy about making friends, even if those friends are cats. At the very least, it's what gave Nyanko Days a unique premise, which I did enjoy. And it being a short with two minute episodes, you can watch the entire season faster than you can watch this video. That's either a shot at myself for this video being too long, or a shot at Nyanko Days for having criminally short episodes. Yeah, I can agree to that. However, now that we're done with the shorts, let's move on to the rest of the full length anime I'm covering, starting with Nambaka. I originally previewed Nambaka back in the Fall 2016 preview, and was going to cover it in the Fall 2016 review. However, since its second season aired right after the first, I decided to just hold off until the second season finished airing, creating another leftover anime situation for myself, but technically not? Technicalities aside, how was Nambaka? Well, I'll start off by saying that it wasn't terrible. The story centers around Jugo, Nico, Uno, and Rock, inmates of Building 13 at Namba Prison. Nambaka follows the daily lives of the prison's inmates and guards, and things get a little weird. Did I say a little weird? I meant to say things get fucking insane. Nambaka is an action anime, however, four to five episodes in, I realized the action I expected prison breaks, roughhousing, maybe some martial arts was not the action Nambaka had in store. Key blast, pyromancy, and sword arms. I actually found it a little off-putting at first, but Nambaka's comedic charm helped me adjust to this action dissonance I was having with the anime. Seriously, if it hadn't been for some of those comedic bits, especially between the Warden and Hajime, I might have dropped this anime. Well, maybe not dropped, but I wouldn't have waited until Season 2 was done to review this anime. That's either a testament to how good the Warden and Hajime scenes are, or a showcase of how weak the anime is in other areas. Amongst all the decent action and comedy, there was a whole lot of exposition. Not all of it's bad, mind you, but there's just so much and with characters that add almost nothing to the story. Did we really need an entire episode dedicated to Sakumo's backstory? I don't think so. It's specifically annoying as well once you find out that the anime just ends. Half of season 2 is about building up to a fight against a specific character, and just as Hajime and Yugo meet up to confront him, we get this end card. Show's over, go home, no climactic fight for you, me, or anyone else. If it hadn't spent so much time telling us about minor characters, then maybe we would have had a conclusive ending. While Nambaka did end up leaving a sour taste in my mouth, I should try and remember some of the things I did enjoy, like the color palette. Nambaka is colorful, bright, and shiny, though some of that is due to all the sparkles this anime has glistening in it. It's an odd aesthetic, I'll say that much. They're there during the happy comedic bits, but tend to disappear during the serious and dramatic moments, so they do serve some purpose. Wrapping Nambaka up, I liked its aesthetics and some of its comedy, Again, specifically mentioning the scenes between the Warden and Hajime being the real bright spot in said comedy. The action wasn't what I expected, but I was able to acclimate to it and appreciate some of the cool action scenes. Nambaka really hammers home exposition to the point of it being annoying. Then it just ends right before the climax, and a lot of good Nambaka does gets overshadowed because of it. Continuing the somewhat law enforcement theme, Aka, 13 Territory Inspection Department. Yeah, it's a bit of a bland title. And to be honest, its synopsis isn't much better. Here it goes. The Kingdom of Doha, which is subdivided into 13 states, is celebrating its monarch's 99th birthday. These 13 states have many agencies that are controlled by the giant organization known as Aka. Within Aka, Jean Otis is the second in command of the inspection agency. His agency has 10 people placed in each of the 13 states, with a central office in the capital city. They keep track of all the activities of Aka across the kingdom and keep data on each state's Aka office flowing toward the central office. Jean also often has business trips from the capital to other districts to check on the situation and personnel there. Bwah. You still awake? That's how the synopsis reads on sites like my anime list and Wikipedia. And be honest, it doesn't sell this anime whatsoever. However, if I told you these trips Jean is taking are because of a rumor of a coup d'etat to overthrow the current monarchy, and is an anime that has a lot of political intrigue on who knows what and how much they know, would you say that sounds like a more interesting anime? Good, because that's exactly what's going on here in Aka. The story is something I can't get too specific about because of spoilers, but I'll say that the anime, much like the main character, Jean himself, has a very laid back feel. Everything happens at a steady pace, and not much happens that gets the heart racing, including the climax. A political or police thriller, this is not, and there are only a handful of scenes that I would even consider action scenes. I do feel the mood Aka sets is what makes this anime interesting. It starts with the opening, which is a very cool upbeat song with a lot of pretty visuals getting you excited for the episode. The episodes themselves, as I previously mentioned, are all really laid back, which I feel gives you time to appreciate the art of the character designs, backgrounds, and animation. Then there's the ending, which has mostly grey visuals as well as slow, beautiful music giving it a more somber tone. 
Touching on a few negatives, plot can be a little confusing towards the middle, before it starts to explain what's happened or what's happening. While I do enjoy its laid back tone, I do wish it had been more thrilling in spots. As I briefly mentioned before, even the climax is pretty tame. Actually, you know what? I'll go on record and say that the climax isn't just tame, but underwhelming. It's not that it doesn't make sense or anything, it just doesn't feel like much of a payoff after all the build up. However, I do find some of the aftermath intriguing. To finish Akka, it had a lot of pretty art and visuals, it's a good political drama, it has a laid back feeling while watching that very much matches its main character's personality, but said laid back feeling does make the climax underwhelming. From law enforcement to religion, up next is Gabriel Dropout. Meet the Archangel Gabriel. Yes, the same Gabriel who wields the horn that once blown signals the end of days. She's been sent to Earth as part of a program by Heaven that requires all young angels to live and study among humans in order to become full-fledged angels. Left to her own vices, she becomes addicted to video games and eventually becomes a shut-in. However, before she fell from grace, Gabriel made friends with the demon Venette, whose attempts to revert Gabriel back to her previous self are in vain. The two later meet Raphael, Gabriel's sadist angel classmate from Heaven, as well as Satania, the clumsy self-proclaimed future ruler of the Underworld. Gabriel Dropout follows these four friends' comedic lives as they utterly fail to understand what it truly means to be a demon or an angel. I really don't have a lot of bad stuff to say about Gabriel Dropout. It's a solid situational comedy that subverts the ideas of what most people define as an angel or a demon. Vina is respectful and responsible while Gabriel is a slob addicted to video games, practically wallowing in sin. Trissa Tanya is egotistical and tries to cause mischief, but underneath that she actually has a kind heart, while Rafi goes out of her way to tease and torment others usually Satanya. It's a simple twist of expectations like that that make Gabriel Dropout stand out, but it backs that up with well-handled comedy scenes. Bwah, there are a lot of good examples of comedy scenes in Gabriel Dropout, but I think I'll use my favorite scene as an example. In episode 6, tired of always losing to Gabriel, Satanya turns to the Hell Shopping Network and buys a 44 caliber Magnum revolver. What's the first thing she does with this gun? She brings it to school, of course. There's nothing worse than spoiling a good joke, so I won't dive too much into specifics, but the characters play off each other wonderfully in this scene. However, what I find just as funny is all the expressions of the background characters, clearly surprised to see a student wielding a gun at school, but are content on watching this event play out. The animation is good, making the nice character designs look better. It has a good opening and maybe even a better ending. I really am having a hard time coming up with anything overtly negative. The biggest thing might be it not spending enough time in heaven and hell, mostly because the arc where the characters are back at home just sort of ends. Gabriel and Rafi are in heaven, and Satanya and Vine are in hell. Satanya calls Gabriel to help her sneak into heaven. Gabriel agrees. End of episode. Next episode, the characters are back on Earth. I can't help but feel that because of the way the scene plays out, that we were building up to something that then never happened. Apparently, it was the same in the manga, too. Well, points to the anime, I guess, for sticking to the source material. I then immediately revoked those points for the anime not expanding on the original source material. Overall, Gabriel Dropout was solid. It has that one blemish where the story abruptly changes, but other than that, it was a good fun comedy, with fun characters and fun moments. It was fun, and that's all it needed to be. Moving on to yet another leftover from the fall 2016 season, March Comes In Like a Lion. If you recall from when I previewed March Comes In Like a Lion, then you remember it follows Rei Kiriyama, a 17-year-old professional shogi player. He's estranged from his family and has scarcely any friends. Among his acquaintances are the three Komoto sisters, Akari, Hinata, and Momo. Ray frequently visits them, getting the care and affection he never quite had while with his foster family. We also remember that one of my primary reasons I was interested in March Comes In Like a Lion was because it was being animated by Shaft. And boy did they deliver. From the character designs, to the camera angles, to the lighting, to the animation, and yes, even to the head tilts, all those trademark Shaft stylings are here on display, and mesh well with the dramatic tone March Comes In Like a Lion sets. Speaking of those dramatic tones, there's quite a lot of dramatic scenes, ranging from tense shogi battles that don't just involve Rei, but also involve other characters like Shimada and Sumisu. Then there's the more personal character drama that again also involves other characters like Shimada and Sumisu, and of course Rei, who's really had it rough up to this point when it comes to his family life, especially when it deals with his foster sister Kyoko, who Rei himself describes as lightning on a clear day, a moment of brilliance that later on brings driving rain. She's a fascinating character to watch, who walks the line in between doting sister and manipulative psychopath. However, it's not all doom and gloom. As much as March comes in like a line depicts Ray drowning under the weight of everything he has to deal with, it can also be incredibly uplifting and cheerful, usually happening when the Kawamoto sisters are around. Their scenes are so bubbly and happy compared to the rest, it's easy to forget all the drama plaguing Ray. 
Then reality sets in and it's absolutely soul crushing. But then Momo says something cute and all the bad stuff goes away again. There are only a couple negative things I can say about March Comes In Like a Lion and there are minor ones at that. One is that it has somewhat of a slow burn. It takes a while for it to sort of get going, and once it does, it's still gingerly paced. Though, given an option between having an anime paced a little too fast versus an anime paced a little too slow, I would rather have an anime be a little on the slow side. The other negative thing is that March Comes In Like a Lion sort of just ends. However, not to the extent Nambaka did. And if I compare the two, March Comes In Like a Lion does a much better job wrapping things up, by Ray summarizing his journey and the people he's met thus far. And Season 2 is already scheduled for this fall, so I'm not too bummed about how things finished in Season 1. To summarize my thoughts on March Comes In Like a Lion, it may be a tad on the slow side in regards to pacing, but it has some captivating moments and characters. It's almost as soul crushing as it is uplifting, and is all wrapped up in that eye-catching shaft goodness. Up next, Bang Dream. It follows high school student Hanabi Yasuoka, who is in love with Narumi Kanai. However, Hanabi realizes that Narumi is in love with Akane Minagawa. Hanabi then meets Mugi Awaye, who is in love with Akane. Hanabi and Mugi later make a pact and begin a fake relationship to satisfy each other's loneliness from their respective unrequited loves, both emotionally and sexually. They agree- What do you mean the wrong anime? No, I'm pretty sure- No, wait, you're right, you're right. Bang Dream is about forming a band while Scum's Wish is about people banging. Yeah, not sure how I got those confused. Reading the right synopsis, Bang Dream follows high school student Kasumi Toyama, who ever since she was very young has been searching for the star beat, a sparkling and exciting sound she heard while looking up at the night sky. She comes across the star-shaped guitar in the storage area of an old pawn shop. Feeling a rush and excitement she never felt before, Kasumi forms a band with four other girls, Saya, Tae, Arisa, and Rimi. While I say she forms a band with four other girls, one of the things I enjoyed about this series was how much of a process that was. Kasumi doesn't join a pre-existing club or band and therefore has to convince each member to join piece by piece. And it takes over half the season to do that. Each member has their own hang-ups or reasons why they don't want or can't join Kasumi's band. And doing that gives the characters a lot of characterization. Just to throw out a few examples, Rimi is shy and quiet but also lives in the shadow of her older sister who is also in a band. Then there is Saya who loves the drums and used to be in a band prior, but her family situation prevents her from doing it. Well, to be more exact, her family situation makes her feel that she can't do it. And then there's Kasumi who even after forming the band is by far the weakest link and has to struggle through and accept that. There really is a decent level of characterization going on for an anime that at first glance may appear to be a K-On or Love Live knockoff. If I'm going to somewhat compare Bang Dream to k and Love Live, I should mention if the songs in Bang Dream are any good compared to the other two. While music is very subjective, I'd say they're alright. I wouldn't say the songs in Bang Dream are better than the songs in k or Love Live, but they aren't terrible. Really, the biggest problem with Bang Dream is its animation, and not the CG animation either. While I don't love the hard cuts to and from CG and traditional animation, the traditional animation, a lot of times, just doesn't look good characters going off model, stiff animation in general, or scenes where the character's line of sight is completely off. Seriously, it looks like Saya is reading her lines from behind the camera. And as bad as it is at times, it's somehow worse during the ending animation, which is actually kind of impressive considering 95% of it is still shots of the characters. But just look how off model the characters are. How did this turn into this? My personal thought, and I don't know how true it is, just my personal thought, is that maybe it was fully animated at one point, looked like crap, so they just use screenshots instead. My only real evidence to support my hypothesis is the scene where the characters are running across a bridge. I just can't imagine that would be drawn that way if it was initially going to be used as a still image for the ending animation. A thing you see at the end of almost every episode. It's frankly inexcusable to have your characters look this bad through the entire ending. So yeah, Bang Dream doesn't have the best animation. The songs are decent, however the characters are handled really well, and are a big reason, despite the animation, I overall enjoyed this anime. Now moving on to Scum's Wish, it follows high school student Hanabi Yasuroka, who is in love with Narumi Kanai, her older childhood friend and homeroom teacher. However, Hanabi realizes that he's in love with the new music teacher, Akane Minagawa. Hanabi then meets Mugi Awaye, a student who's in love with Akane. Hanabi and Mugi later make a pact and begin a fake relationship to satisfy each other's loneliness from their respective unrequited loves, both emotionally and sexually. They agree to not fall in love with each other and end the relationship if their love is returned from the people they are in love with. So yeah, 
as I mentioned before, a lot of banging in this anime. And I realize that might be a turnoff to some people, either because it's animated softcore porn, or because it depicts teenagers having sex. Animated softcore porn it may be at times, but it's primarily a character drama focused on Hanabi and Mugi trying to starve off their loneliness. As far as depicting teenagers having sex, newsflash, whether you like it or not, it does happen. Though I assume most teenage relationships aren't as complicated as what's depicted here in Scum's Wish. When I say complicated, I don't mean that their relationships are hard to follow from an audience perspective. It's just Hanbi and Mugi's relationship is unconventional. That involves not just them and the people they love, but the people who love them. What a tangled web they weave. It leads to quite a bit of drama and a lot of sweet, sweet internal suffering for the characters. This is probably as good as time as any to mention that one of my major enjoyments from the series came from the amount of schadenfreude I got from watching these characters suffer. A lot of the characters are arrogant or manipulative, you know, scum, and watching them break down put a smile on my face. I enjoyed them making potentially bad decisions and having to deal with the consequences. The strangest thing about it is I don't dislike or hate these characters, quite the opposite in fact, I really like them. Either because they're flawed or because they're trying to do better but can't break their habit. It makes them seem a little less like characters and more like everyday people just looking for love. Taking a more technical look at Scum's Wish, it has solid animation and the art style is simply gorgeous. Both the opening and the ending are stellar to watch and listen to, good song and visuals for the opening, same goes for the ending, but I think I prefer its slightly more abstract watercolor kaleidoscope thing it has going on. Also the song during the ending, Hey Kosen, which translates to parallel lines, is quite poignant to the series itself. As much as I enjoyed this series and as much as I think it's good, there were a couple of things I had problems with. One is the final episode. The problem isn't the ending itself, in fact I love the ending. No, the problem is the time skips and flashbacks in the final episode. It's a little hard to keep track of when some of the stuff is happening. It tells you once and then goes back and forth between the present and the past, so you have to be a little actively aware of what it's doing to follow what's going on. The other problem is that Scum's Wish does a good job handling the character's development and progression. Hanabi, Mugi, Kanai, Akane, Echan, and Mocha are all slightly better people than when the series started. Heck, even some of Akane's boy toys show some growth. Which is why I find Echan's cousin's character a bit of a letdown comparatively. He, like everyone else, is a bit scummy, but unlike everyone else, we don't see his character develop. So he ends up being just some guy who's romantically interested in his cousin and gives her decent advice about Hanabi that one time. To wrap Scum's Wish up, it may neglect one minor character, but does a good job with the rest. The final episode might be slightly hard to follow, but the animation and art is top notch. And these characters, whether you love them or hate them, were fun to watch. Either because they made potentially bad life choices, or because they grew and developed over time, learning from their mistakes. Up next, in stark contrast to the previous Scum's Wish drama romance, comes Masamune Kun's Revenge, a school rom com harem, with a fairly unique twist in its premise. Masamune Makabe was a chubby boy who had a close relationship with Aki Aragaki, a beautiful wealthy girl, until one day she cruelly rejected him and gave him the nickname Pig's Foot. Seeking revenge against his tormentor, Masamune changed his name, began dieting and working out every day to become a fit and handsome, albeit vain, high school student. When he encounters Aki once again, she no longer recognizes him and he commits to his plan to seduce her into falling in love with him, so that he can embarrassingly reject her to exact his vengeance. Interesting as the premise sounds, a young man seeking revenge on the girl who broke his heart by breaking hers, there's writing on the wall very early on that in the process of trying to get Aki to fall in love with him, Masamune will fall in love with her. While not against that as a potential ending, it's hinted at so early on that the premise and the concept of the anime loses its meaning almost immediately. Masamune falling for Aki is also alluded to so early on that the so-called harem aspect of this anime is practically dead on arrival, Neko being the primary reason preventing this harm from flatlining. She's mysterious, clearly has an alternative motive, and willing to take things to Scum's Wish level. Her presence in general makes the anime a more enjoyable experience to watch, especially when compared to the other girls in the so-called harem, like personalityless Yoshino and background character Taie. There's a few surprise twists and revelations about characters that keep things interesting enough, and the animation is decent. There's a few scenes where it stands out compared to the rest, but for the most part it's all pretty standard. That's also a pretty good way to describe this anime as a whole. It's decent. It has some scenes, like with Neko, that stand out compared to the rest, but because it alludes to Masamune falling in love with Aki so early on, instead of getting his revenge, it mostly feels like a pretty typical and standard rom-com anime. Moving right along, Saga of Tanya the Evil. On the front line of the war, there is a little girl. Blonde hair, blue eyes, and porcelain white skin. She commands her squad with a lisping voice. Her name? Tanya de Gerchav. 
However, in reality, she is one of Japan's most elite salarymen, reborn after angering a mysterious being who calls himself God. This little girl who prioritizes efficiency in her own career over everything else will become the most dangerous being amongst the mages of the Imperial Army. Ah, Saga of Tanya the Evil, an anime if you recall I was very much looking forward to in my Winter 2017 preview. I wouldn't say Tanya the Evil surpassed my expectations, but it did fulfill them admirably. Most of that came with knowing what I was getting going in. Magic-infused alternate history of World War I slash World War II and a crazy sadistic little girl giving commands and coming up with plans. So I very much got what I wanted from this anime. The cinematography is on point, especially during the fight scenes, and I also must commend it on its use of music in some of those scenes, as well as the lack thereof. There are a couple of moments in episode 11 specifically that there is no background music, but simply the sounds of a dogfight. Since we're discussing the sound of the anime, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention Aoyuki as the voice of Tanya. She pretty much nailed the sweet little girl and raving psychopath aspects of the character. It does a good job showcasing the brutality of war, even if at times the people in the war look a little blah. That is easily one of my major gripes about the anime. Some of the CG, for lack of a better word, is bad. It breaks visual cohesion of the anime, not just in look, but in movement as well. Then there is the ending, which very much feels like a prologue to a hypothetical second season or core. However, at the time of recording, unlike March Comes In Like a Lion, there's no word of the series being continued. Overall, I enjoyed Saga of Tanya the Evil. Its CG is a little weak at times, and the ending only teases more, with nothing to follow as of yet. But the cinematography and sound design was pretty awesome at times. Again, I'll include Aoyuki's performance. Most of all, I went in looking for a crazy psycho little girl leading the military in a magic alternative history of Europe, and that's what I got. We're finally to the penultimate anime that I'll be covering, which means it's time for my sleeper hit of the season. A sleeper hit is an anime that didn't get a lot of buzz or attention, but that I thought was pretty good. However, this sleeper hit is a bit different. This anime did get a lot of buzz and attention in Japan, and unlike my other sleeper hits, this anime took me a while to appreciate. Welcome to Japari Park, because my sleeper hit for the winter 2017 anime season is none other than Kimono Friends. A girl known only as Kaban wakes up in Japari Park, with no recollection of who she is or how she got there. She quickly encounters a serval cat named Serval, who quickly becomes a friend. Together, they set out on an adventure to find out what kind of animal Kaban is, passing through multiple regions of Japari Park and meeting new friends along the way. On the surface, Kimono Friends should be crap. The problem isn't that it's CG, it's that it's crap CG. The frame rate, especially early on, is atrocious. There's a lot of poorly rendered scenes and characters and, from a technical aspect, it's not very good. The anime also has a very educational feel to it, mostly due to these scenes before and after the ad break, that have various zookeepers explaining the animals seen in that episode. But considering it aired on Wednesdays at 1.35 in the morning in Japan, it pretty much debunks the four kids slash educational debate. So how does such a childish looking anime trend globally on Twitter during the winter 2017 season? And how did it become one of the most popular anime on Nico Nico, Japan's equivalent to YouTube? Honestly, I'm not 100% sure how it got so popular, but maybe it has something to do with why I was able to eventually enjoy the show. As I mentioned, early on, Kimono Friends was crap from a technical standpoint, but where it was interesting was its story. While I think the plot itself gets a little convoluted towards the end, the story of Kaban seemingly being the only human does tantalize the imagination. Where are all the other humans? Why are all the animals cute animal girls? like wolf girls and penguin girls or giraffe girls. What's happened to the world? Those are the questions I wanted answered and why I would watch this show week to week. As I watched it week to week, the piss poor animation, the poor rendering, and the characters themselves all became endearing to watch. Whether that was due to some Moe effect or Stockholm Syndrome, I'm afraid to hazard a guess, but I'll say despite Kimono Friend's poor looking quality, there is something charming under the surface and makes it worth checking out at least until the merchandising deals go into effect and everyone attached to this project sells out. Hopefully by then the animation in any future anime project will be looking better. We've made it to the final anime I'll be covering for the Winter 2017 Anime Review. I usually like to reserve this spot for the most popular anime of the season, which for the most part seemed to be the second season of Konosuba, however it being a sequel I don't feel I need to sing its praises too much. Though I will say I enjoyed it and is almost as good as the first season. My major problem being that it took some liberties with Cosmos' character in the finale that I feel went against his established character. Getting back on track, the anime I want to finish the video on wasn't a sequel and was pretty popular this season itself. 
I also first covered it back in the Winter 2017 preview. I'm of course referring to Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Kobayashi lives alone in her apartment until one day Toru appears and they end up living together. Toru looks down on humans as she sees them as foolish and inferior beings, but having been saved by Kobayashi, she does everything she can to repay the debt by becoming Kobayashi's dragon maid. Despite being extremely efficient at housework, Toru's unorthodox methods of housekeeping often end up scaring Kobayashi and usually bring more trouble than help. Back in the Winter 2017 preview, I mentioned that the number one reason I was interested in watching Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid was that it was being animated by Kyoto Animation, and they once again proved why they are one of the best in the business. From comedic scenes to serious scenes and even some action scenes, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid's animation and style was simply beautiful and stunning. All the characters, specifically the dragons, are unique, stand out, and look great. If I had to pick a personal favorite character design, it's close between all of them, but I've got to go with Lokoa for her easygoing expression. And there's just something about her that always catches my attention. Something I just can't stop looking at. Her eyes. They're absolutely radiant, both of them. What'd you think I was talking about? The animation and style, as great as it is, is only one piece to a greater whole. You can have the prettiest anime in the world, but it wouldn't mean much if the characters in the story were pants. Which is not the case here in Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. It was fun to see Toru and Kobayashi try to learn to live with each other. It was cute watching Kana learn to trust Kobayashi, and it was even cuter watching her make her own friends and learn more about humans by going to school. There's a lot of themes that Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid has and touches on, but the primary ones seem to be about trying to fit in, and of course, love and friendship. It however also hits on a few darker themes like Toru inevitably outliving Kobayashi, and how she tries to cope with that. It's a mixture of all those fun, cute, and maybe a little too real things that make this anime an amazing watch. As far as negatives go, I don't really have any personally, but I will mention some stuff I feel people in general might have problems with, most of which are character related. I get the feeling that everyone is going to like Riko making Hegao faces when she's with Kana. I also get the feeling that everyone will be down with Lukoa being a bit of a Shotokan towards Shota. To each their own, if you think that's too much for you, don't watch it. But if you look past that and see the other stuff I've mentioned, like the characters and their designs, the compelling themes, and the overall beautiful art and animation, then I think you'll enjoy Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Thanks for watching the Winter 2017 Anime Review. If you want more information on any of the anime I reviewed in this video, you can find links to their My Anime List page down in the description. So what was your favorite anime from the Winter 2017 season? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And remember, I'm your anime advisor, Anime Advisor, helping you figure out what anime you want to watch.